figure out is this what they call the bad emperor problem. If you have a authoritarian decision maker, no rule of law, no democratic accountability, how do you guarantee this continuing supply of good emperors that make you know good decisions? And the Chinese have had some really terrible ones in the past, the last one being you know, Mao Zedong. Uh, and so that's the problem I think they really have not solved. If I could just follow up though, but what makes you, s why, should we be, why should we be optimistic about what's happening here? Uh, I can understand what you said about, about pessimism there, but uh, how do we know what's, you know, the problems we have here are short run and uh, we haven't uh, run into a more- no, We don't, no, I mean there's no guarantee. Oh, okay. Uh, I think if you look at the course of American history, at moments when we've faced a severe national crisis, there's usually been the leadership forthcoming that's actually created the consensus to get past all the checks and balances and do the right thing. But you know, there's no guarantee that that's gonna happen in the future. You have another economist waiting for you in the shooting gallery. Um, your name, if I'm not mistaken, is a Japanese name. Uh, you never mentioned Japan. And so I'm quite, quite, quite curious what's happening there. Uh, and it also leads me to this question, and that has to do with the, uh, with the demographic evolution of these societies. Uh, it seems uh, Japan is sort of self-destructing and, uh, and going down to zero, or yeah. close to that. And actually, Jap uh, the, uh, uh, China, with its one-child uh, policy, is not very far behind. So if one looks out, let's say in the next 50, 100 years, uh, these societies, I mean, they, I mean, they don't, it doesn't look very good if one yeah. would use a mathematical model and project, I mean, they basically disappear. Well, okay, so there's two, separate, there's two separate yeah. problems. One is this basic demographic problem. And it's true that Japan is leading the way, although now every country in Asia basically is in that same boat. So Taiwan actually has a lower total fertility rate, you know, South Korea is plunging very rapidly, Singapore, uh, for a whole variety of reasons. Um, in societies with educated women, you know, they just don't want to have kids. And in Asia, I've got these cultural theories about <laughs> what it's, what's wrong with Asian men that they don't want to have a lot of, women don't want to have a lot of children with them, but that's a separate, <laughs> separate story. But it's going on in Southern Europe, you know, as well. You know, Italy, Spain, a lot of countries in Europe have very far below replacement uh, fertility rates. And as you said, China uh, will get there in another you know, 15 years or so. And even if they abolish the one-child family, I think the trend in that whole region is to much, much lower fertility. So that's a problem everybody's gonna have to deal with at a certain point. Uh, the countries that have the worst problem are the ones that don't permit immigration, like Japan, because they can't make up for that deficit of younger workers by, by bringing in people from the uh, from the outside. Now, in addition to that, it seems to me that Japan has got a version of the disease that we've got, which is democratic indecision. Uh, and theirs has been going on, however, for you know a period of about 20 years with a brief uh, um, uh, um, interlude under, under uh, Prime Minister Koizumi that, that get, did give them some fairly vigorous uh, leadership. But, you know, in many respects, Japan's got the same problem. They're they're trapped by interest groups. They can't make big decisions. They don't have uh, a leadership that can pull together, you know, the country to make certain painful decisions and economic reform that uh, would get them uh, uh, going again. And in a way, it's very depressing from the standpoint of, of democracy in the region because here you got China that is making all these big decisions as an authoritarian country and, you know, in, in many respects pulling ahead. And I can't tell you when Japan is going to turn that around either. So I want to tell you something. If you liked this evening's performance, we are going to have President Obama's Assistant Secretary of Defense in two weeks' time. Uh, and we would like for you to come and hear him. He is a Columbia, not a Harvard PhD. And uh, for 10 years, he was a big shot at the Kennedy School at Harvard. And then decided, like many, he got Potomac fever and came down and worked with Clinton and went to three of the big meetings with Yeltsin 
and then a summit with the Chinese leaders just before Clinton left. And now he was back with Mr. Obama. He has been President Obama's leading figure on the issue of cybersecurity. And now since we have books being published called Cyber Warfare, which are not very well disguised as the possibility of war with China over the issues that are involved with cyber warfare, he'll be a very interesting guy to talk to. So he will come and share that with you. Also, and for you people who love India, we have coming soon because this Friday is opening a magnificent show at the Asian Art Museum, the show of the Maharajas. And if there's anything that proves what our friend has been saying, the Indian Maharajas are a sample of where you had localism and families much more important than in a sense of a central India for many, many centuries. And now what they're sending to us are all those diamonds and rubies. They're even sending a solid sterling silver carriage to show you the lifestyle of the rich and famous, like the people in Palm Springs that I was talking about earlier. So you will like, I think, hearing him. He's very forceful, has very strong opinions, and he comes to us directly now, more so than others, from that wonderful capital of ours. So that is Michael Nacht, N-A-C-H-T, from the man who's coming out of Washington and then out of Berkeley, where he was the graduate dean in public policy. And then we have the famous art show, actually, I think before that. It's all within the same week period where you'll get to look up close and personal at the art and the times of the Indian Maharajas. So now, ladies and gentlemen, we now soon break for wine because we know you've sat long enough. And we sit also down with our author, and he signs books for all of you who would like to buy a book. They're out there on uh, the counter. So please join me in thanking Frank for coming today. <laughs>